Hello and welcome to Read Read. Today I want to talk about Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. I am so happy that I was able to finish uh, this book within the year and this is pretty much the last book that I'm going to read this year. It's definitely the last video, uh, thoughts and comments, uh, uh, like review video that I'm going to do, although I do have some other um, uh, content uh, planned just to finish up before we start 2024. Um, I loved Don Quixote so much and I can't wait to talk about uh, the things that I really loved and enjoyed about it um, but uh, what I figured I'll do is I know that because this is a long massive sprawling novel and um, it's going to be uh, so likely that I'm just going to start rambling and jumping uh, to and from uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about just uh, some of like the core points the key things that stood out to me and then I'm going to jump in and start reading some extracts and some examples uh, just as and then just read them kind of uh, from the start to the end of the book and hopefully use those extracts as a means to jump off and start talking about other things. Um, I will talk about what I knew going into Don Quixote and just uh, general impressions, but I would say it's safe to assume pretty early on that I will start talking about spoilers. So uh, if you haven't read Don Quixote or if you've only read part one but you haven't read part two, uh, then I definitely implore you to go and finish the Quixote because part two is... Um, uh, quite better than the first one and uh, even if you've only heard about it or if you've <clears throat> uh, if you've uh, just attracted to it but you're worried about it being a bit of a mammoth read um, I can't recommend it enough it reads so well that uh, by the end of it I was just binging 100 pages a day just to kind of go through and uh, like I was so addicted to Don Quixote and uh, this edition is translated by Edith Grossman it's very um, it's a great translation and I also really appreciate the footnotes that she included uh, in order to kind of give some context to the the world of Cervantes uh, so what I'm going to do, I'll quickly talk about um, what I knew about Don Quixote going in and uh, pretty much I knew that the story was set in Spain and I knew that it was about a man named Don Quixote who had spent his whole life uh, reading and uh, he was so obsessed with books, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I think a lot of us can relate, uh, and he had read so many books on uh, knight errantry and chivalry and the, the great tales of King Arthur and uh, Roland and, um, and so on, and uh, one day he just wakes up and he decides that he is going to be a hero, he's going to be the hero of his own life, and he sets off on an adventure, him and his sidekick Sancho Panza, uh, who are, uh, the two of them are some of the just most beautifully fleshed out characters um, that uh, I think I've read in such a long time, but not such a long time because I read a lot of really uh, good books, but um, yeah, it's just, just thinking about the context of this book, um, I think pretty much maybe around page... 250 or 300 I kind of realized like oh yeah I can see why um uh, uh Ugo, Ugamamo or oh, I'm gonna I'm butchering it but um uh, a famous uh, critic said that Cervantes essentially wrote the Spanish Bible um yeah if that's not praise enough please go and uh, read it and uh, another thing that I liked I had a similar experience I suppose with Moby Dick where or what I'd heard about that novel pretty much occurred within a short period of my reading it. So yes, I knew about, knew about that premise that I just mentioned, uh, but I also knew about the incident with the windmills and, uh, and just the general kind of uh, slapstick humor between Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. But when, you know, that uh, the incident with the windmills happens essentially on in chapter six or, or chapter seven, uh, that means that we still have basically this much of the book left that was completely new content and uh, is just absolutely um, it was such a delight to think you know oh hey I've heard I've heard these things about Don Quixote and uh, uh, 50 pages in they've already all happened so I've got uh, just all of this new stuff uh, to read but it also made me maybe think about uh, I wonder if the people who talk about those have only read those first 50 pages um, uh, in any case j I'm not going to go through like I mean uh, I don't even think I could go through and do a sort of episode by episode summary, but um, what I will do is I'm going to talk about the, the core themes that I liked and that I got, and I'll sli uh, slightly reference the uh, Harold Bloom introduction uh, in the beginning of this. 
which uh, I believe that some people are a bit polarized on how Harold Bloom thinks about uh, Don Quixote, but uh, I liked a lot of the stuff that I was reading in the introduction. And uh, then jump in, read some extracts. So, um, one of the things that uh, stood out to me in the first part in particular uh, is that, uh, you know, of course there's this idea uh, of uh, Don Quixote kind of seeing reality in his own vision and so you know when and there are many many famous examples of course with the windmills he perceives them as giants that need to be slain but also with the uh, with the golden uh, basin that he perceives as being this great helmet um, uh, we've got this idea of sort of fantasizing and indulging in um, like creating the reality that you uh, that you desire and so I think because of that because of Don Quixote's, you know, undying um, uh, energy to kind of see the world as being uh, a magical, uh, mythical, uh, beautiful place in which uh, adventures can be had. Um, it's very, uh, it's, you know, of course it's very inspiring and I can see why so many people gravitate to and resonate with the character of, of Don Quixote, but... Uh, and another thing that I really liked, we will get, we will talk a little bit about how meta the book gets in the uh, second part. But um, something I liked that uh, Borges, uh, Borges kind of uh, leaned in on, uh, and he uh, really liked, and he mentioned is. I think he mentions it in the essay "Partial Magic" in the Quixote, uh, where he essentially says one of the the great things about it is that Don Quixote, like transcends books and kind of makes that a reality and so he's able to kind of escape it and he's able to give um adventure and life and uh quality to the to the everyday world um but because Don Quixote becomes so meta and that the book be like makes, makes an appearance within the book itself uh, so part one uh, ends up uh, appearing and has been read by other characters in part two uh, Borges says that there's the kind of twist of uh, if Don if Don Quixote is not allowed to be sort of real uh, and being a fictitious character, then we the readers are also fictitious. And I I really enjoyed balancing that this sort of idea of Don Quixote Don Quixote the person Don Quixote the book as what I'm physically holding in my hands and Don Quixote, the, the concept of the book that also appears within the book uh, because, you know, Cervantes uh, makes an appearance in the book several times, his, his own books are mentioned and so, yeah, it's very fun and it's very meta and very mind-blowing um, and so but one of the things that actually really stood out to me is how important kind of deception and indulging in those fantasies is. And I think that might have been what made uh, what like made Nabokov feel like the book was so dark and so um, uh, kind of mean or, or like just indulging in making fun of the character Don Quixote. Because a lot of the times, uh, like one of the... Um, one of the things that happens is that uh, you will get these balances of people saying, oh no, uh, Senor, Senor Don Quixote, you're going crazy. Of course, this is just, uh, you know, insert real world thing. Um, but then at some parts, uh, people will lie to sort of indulge him and uh, even S Sancho Panza, so especially the, the time when I noticed it and I started to realize how important uh, deception was as a core theme in the first part was when uh, Don Quixote kind of vowed to uh, like stay in that forest for a little for a period until uh, Sancho Panza goes and meets uh, Dulcinea of Toboso and kind of uh, passes a message on to Don Quixote and then uh, afterwards instead of actually going to find uh, Dulcinea uh, Sancho Panza just goes off kind of hangs out for or he runs into some characters from the village like the, the barber and the priest and uh, then he just goes back and he tells Don Quixote that uh, he actually did go and he's um, he makes up this whole story and it's a very fun encounter of, um, you know, the, um, uh, it's, it's a very fun encounter and it is a pretty, uh, a clear example of when we start to see, uh, some of those, some of those delusions, uh, being fed of Don Quixote and part of, you know, a question that kind of hangs out is, or 
I think a question that I was tempted to ask a lot of the time, but I never was actually convinced or, uh, like, had any convictions that this was a valid question, was why does... Why does Sancho Panza um, even stay with Don Quixote? And pretty, pretty definitely in the second part, you realize it's it's just because they love each other, and uh, that sustains uh, essentially for the whole thing. Um, and they're, uh, like they're, it was even really gratifying to sort of read an extract um, where. Uh, that that I'll read uh, probably quite a bit later in this video because it's getting, uh, it's you know I can already tell this is going to be a long video. Uh, some so yeah, deception as a core theme in the first part. In the second part, uh, I would I had a way of describing this, but I realised that uh, uh, Howard Bloom actually said this perfectly, where he wrote uh, in part two, everyone they encounter is acutely co conscious that fiction has disrupted the order of reality. So easily the most stark difference in uh, part one and part two is just that part one exists in the world in part two and it has been read by some characters and so rather than Don Quixote uh, like kind of enforcing and putting his vision on the world to see, uh, you know, to get what he wants out of it. Instead, people are actually using Don Quixote, the character be of who they've been introduced through the book, who we readers have also been introduced in the book, uh, introduced to through the book. They are using him to indulge in their own fantasy desires. Uh, and the most clear example of that is the Duke and the Duchess in the second part, who are just outright mean to the point where I can really see why, like like what uh, uh, Nabokov is talking about, where it, it's just, it can be really kind of hard to stomach some of the pranks that get played on Don Quixote. And so... Um, but then there's a kind of balance because then we also get, I can't remember, I'll see his name later when I read the extract from him, but it's Don Antonio. Uh, he has a kind of more wholesome way of getting, um, of being, using Don Quixote for pleasure, but in a wholesome way that doesn't belittle or uh, demean him. Um, so yeah, this kind of idea of uh, fiction changing and shaping reality is uh, is probably the most uh, key outline or, or the key concept that I got from the second part. And the other thing that I'm going to mention now, this is totally not, it's definitely not true and there's no way that this is actually correct. Um, I was so surprised at how important the introduction and the refusal of the fake Quixote was to the development of Don Quixote. So, um, uh, if you'll know, then uh, uh, Don Quixote part one was released, it was very popular, and then uh, part two, while it was being written, some random person wrote uh, a sequel to Don Quixote, and it was the unauthorized uh, sequel, and kind of seeing that uh, Cervantes was um, kind of spurred to go on and, and finish uh, the Quixote, uh, and it was so, it was so baffling that, like, and, it, like, it's such a testament to how good of a writer it, Cervantes was that it seems just inevitable that something like the False Quixote would appear. And I'm not saying that Cervantes wrote the F False Quixote, uh, and I'm not saying that he wanted it to be written, um, but if I, like, found out, or or if we saw some, like, long-lost letters where he talked about knowing that there were going to be unauthorized sequels that were going to be published, uh, I would not be surprised, because it's just so important to the end of the, the book. Like, um, I, I just couldn't believe it. It's like a perfect storm, but... Um, uh, yeah, of course, it's it's just a testament to how great of a writer uh, Cervantes was. I'm going to see if there's any other extracts, but uh, maybe the most uh, important thing is that, um, you know, of course, uh, if you read Harold Bloom, uh, anything Harold Bloom, you can't go too far without him mentioning um, uh, uh, Hamlet. And so there are uh, parallels, you know, Hamlet's play within a play versus uh, Cervantes's. Um, uh, book within a book and I will admit that maybe it's just because it's slower and I was uh, spending more time with it uh, I got more out of that kind of multi-layered uh, um, uh, storytelling I got more of more out of Don Quixote than I did out of Hamlet uh, 
Uh, and another note that I'll quickly mention, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to this a bit later, but uh, the most important event in Don Quixote's life in terms of the story is him meeting Dulcinea uh, in the second part. And I think that... Uh, uh, Unfortunately, I haven't finished his essay, but uh, uh, Eric Auerbach's essay, The Ent Enchanted Dulcinea, he, he talks about how, like, that's the first clear example where Don Quixote's kind of idea or his concept of reality is really, really, truly uh, challenged because of the kind of sort of maybe harmless prank that... Um, Sancho Panza plays on him where when they see these three peasant girls and Sancho Panza says that one of them is uh, Dulcinea and he can see her in her true form, in her true beauty, whereas she just looks like a kind of um, miscellaneous uh, peasant girl to uh, to the Don, um, it's it pretty much shapes his entire, it shapes his motivations for the entire remaining uh, remainder of the novel all the way up until the very, very end. Uh, and so that was something that I, I liked uh, it was great to read uh, Auerbach, Auerbach mention that because, uh, like Harold Bloom talks about it in his introduction, is you know what does what does Don Quixote want to do, or what does uh, Cervantes, uh, oh sorry, what does Hamlet want to do? Like these characters are so complex that we can't really know exactly what they want to do. They just sort of want to be themselves in their most full form or essence. But uh, it was kind of interesting for uh, Auerbach to point out how kind of monumental the experience of seeing uh, of like the enchantment being placed on the outside world as opposed to him so uh, um, yeah yeah uh, those are just the kind of extra notes I think from this point I'm going to start uh, reading extracts and just talking about um, some of the parts that I love about the book so this is something that I love. Uh, being a novel of its time, of course, there are some antiquated uh, views on women, and uh, in some parts it can be uh, a little bit, you know, uh, let's just get through this, talking about, um, you know, the relationship between uh, husbands and wives. But uh, Cervantes definitely does do his part to give uh, um, some female characters some really excellent monologues. And in this one, or, or soliloquies, uh, oh, no, it's more of a monologue. Uh, in this one, this is from a character named Marcella. So the setup is that uh, a man named uh, Griostomo had fallen in love with Marcella because she's very beautiful, and uh, she didn't reciprocate the love to him, and so he died but essentially of heartache. And uh, his friends are, are going to bury him, and uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza come across them, and they uh, they explain the situation to him, and then all of a sudden uh, Marcella appears and gives this great speech. I do not come, O Ambrosio, for any of the causes you have mentioned, but I return here on my own behalf to explain how unreasonable are those who, in their grief, blame me for the death of Griostomo, and so I beg all those present to hear me, for there will be no need to spend much time or waste many words to persuade discerning men of the truth. Heaven made me, as all of you say, so beautiful that you cannot resist my beauty and are compelled to love me, and because of the love you show me, you claim that I am obliged to love you in return. I know, with the natural understanding that God has given me, that everything beautiful is lovable, but I cannot grasp why, simply because it is loved, the thing loved for its beauty is obliged to love the one who loves it. Further, the lover of the beautiful thing might be ugly, and since ugliness is worthy of being avoided, it is absurd for anyone to say, I love you because you are beautiful, you must love me even though I am ugly. But in the event the two are equally beautiful, it does not mean that their desires are necessarily equal, for not all beauties fall in love. Some are a pleasure to the eye, uh, but do not surrender their will, uh, because if all beauties loved and surrendered, there would be a whirl of confused and misled wills, not knowing where they should stop. For since beautiful subjects are infinite, desires would have to be infinite too. And this uh, this continues for pages and pages, and it's really uh, all completely excellent, uh, but I just wanted to read that extract. This is something that's kind of funny. Cervantes, uh, a man who was, um, uh, I believe he was very engaged with and uh, knew a lot about uh, theatre, uh, writes this. Uh, also, this isn't Don Quixote speaking. This is, these are two people. There's um, Senor Canon and uh, the... Uh, um, the he's, Senor Canon is talking to the priest, but it's uh, Senor Canon talking right now. 
If all, or almost all, the plays that are popular now, imaginative works as well as historical ones, are known to be nonsense and without rhyme or reason, and despite this the mob hears them with pleasure and thinks of them and approves of them as good, when they are very far from being so, and the authors who compose them and the actors who perform them say they must be like this because that is just how the mob wants them and no other way, the plays that have a design and follow the story as art demands appeal to a handful of discerning persons who understand them, while everybody else is incapable of comprehending their artistry. And since, as far as the authors and actors are concerned, it is better to earn a living with the crowd than a reputation with the elite, this is what would happen to my book after I had singed my eyebrows trying to keep the precepts I have mentioned and had become the tailor who wasn't paid, uh, which is a proverb that... Um, uh, uh, that uh, Edith Grossman uh, says essentially means like uh, being paid for like doing a service and not being paid for it uh, but that is something that I like as well is uh, early on in the book um, there's a scene where all the people who are seeing how crazy uh, Don Quixote is uh, for being so obsessed with these books on knight errantry uh, even though he can he's perfectly lucid and perfectly intelligent when he's talking about any other topic except being a knight errant um, uh then there's a scene where they go through they go through his library and they go to burn uh, some of his books but it turns out that a lot of the people have actually read and really enjoyed these books uh, and I, I think it's this really it's this fun fine line of uh, you know jumping back to me talking about enjoying uh, how characters in the book the fictional characters enjoyed and derived pleasure from Don Quixote, uh, just like how we real fictional characters uh, derived pleasure from Don Quixote. It's that fun, fine line of saying, you know, I just spent, uh, I don't know how many hours of my life, I guess uh, a little bit less than 50, uh, just in this position. Uh, but of course it was a amazing, uh, a beautiful experience and way of enriching my life. But uh, if you were to just look at it, literally, I just didn't move from various seated positions for uh, like several dozen hours um, and of course like you wouldn't say that that's crazy like that's like just sitting and reading is a crazy not a crazy thing to do but then just suddenly deciding that you want to think that your life is as important as those books and uh, and then you know to quote the meme everyone loses their mind um, uh, I thought that was really I, I just loved the way that uh, like how perfectly aware uh, Cervantes was of the fact that he's like Don Quixote the character is also Don Quixote the book um, and I hope that's not as obvious as I, I hope I'm not saying the obvious part of that and also with the fact that another thing that uh, stood out to me was that knight errantry is, auth is also being an author, uh, which is pretty explicitly outlined in uh, a section where um, uh, Don Quixote is talking to a character and they're asking what the most noble profession is, and uh, Don Quixote essentially says, like, oh, the most noble thing is to be a knight errant because you basically have to know everything, and uh, if you just replace knight errant with being an author, like, it's just, Cervantes is just talking about the process of being an author. This is one that I almost want to print off whenever I ha uh, hear someone being a negative critic. There is no book so bad, said the bachelor, that it does not have something good in it. There is no doubt about that, replied Don Quixote, but it often happens that those who had deservedly won and achieved fame uh, because of their writings lost their fame or saw it diminished when they had their works printed. The reason for that, says Sanson, and Sanson the bachelor is probably, like, the fourth most important character in the book, I would say. Like, of course, there's Don Quixote, uh, Don Quixote Sancho Panza, uh, Dulcinea, and then Sanson the Bachelor. The reason for that, said Sanson, is that since printed works are looked at slowly, their faults are easily seen, and the greater the fame of their authors, the more closely they are scrutinized. Men who are famous for their talent, great poets, eminent historians, are always, or almost always, envied by those whose particular pleasure and entertainment is judging other people's writings without ever having brought anything of their own into the light of day. Uh, that, that is not surprising, said Don Quixote, for there are many theologians who are not good in the pulpit, but are excellent at recognizing the lacks or excesses of those who preach and uh, so considering the fact that this speech and this character Sanson appears in part two it, it was it was really funny to to kind of read and see that uh, Cervantes was able to make some kind of like fun twists and some fun plays on the fact that you know the first part of Don Quixote had a lot of 
a lot of mistakes like uh, and these are very helpfully pointed out by uh, Edith Grossman but um, uh, Cervantes is able to sort of have fun and play them off uh, where uh, a, a famous mistake in the first edition of Don Quixote is that uh, Cervantes forgot to mention that Sancho Panza's donkey got stolen at some point and then in the second part where somebody walks up to him and says oh yeah that history about you is pretty good but they've got some mistakes there was a they didn't talk about how the how the donkey was stolen and and uh, Sancho Panza was like, oh, this is ridiculous. Of course it was stolen in this way. Uh, and then the person said, oh, that wasn't written in the book. And then uh, Sancho Panza says, ah, oh, it must have been a printing error. And this was the extract I, I uh, read, by the way. This is on page uh, 536, which just... Um, uh, so the Squire of the Wood is talking to Sancho Panza. The Squire of the Wood is the main antagonist, who is also uh, Sanson the Bachelor, uh, who has come to sort of... Uh, Sons on the Bachelor, the learned, intelligent man, his, his life mission is to really and truly make Don Quixote give up his fantasy and to go back to being, uh, you know, um, Alonso, Alonso Quijano, uh, the Alonso Quijano the good, uh, or the saint. And um, so uh, that same man who was talking before about uh, publishing uh, books, um, he is in this section portraying as the, the uh, squire of the wood. And so Sandra Panza is saying, uh, you know, yeah, I, have, I serve a master and you're criticizing me, but you also serve a master and, uh, you know, that your master's as great a fool as mine is. And the squire of the wood says, uh, oh, a fool but brave and more of a scoundrel than fool or brave. And Sancho defends uh, Don Quixote and says, not mine. I mean, there's nothing of the scoundrel in him. Mine's as innocent as a baby. He doesn't know how to harm anyone. He can only do good to everybody and there's no malice in him. A child could convince him it's night in the middle of the day and because he's simple, I love him with all my heart and couldn't leave him no matter how many crazy things he does. I wanted to read an extract, uh, by the way, uh, of just to demonstrate how beautiful Cervantes can write. Um, you know, there is, I mean, this book is riddled with poems and, and songs that he wrote, uh, but he's just a really kind of stunning example of um, uh, his prose writing. This is from the second part. By this time, a thousand different kinds of brightly coloured birds began to warble in the streets, and with their varied and joyous songs, they seemed to welcome and greet the new dawn, who, through the doors and balconies of the Orient, was revealing the beauty of her face and shaking from her hair an infinite number of liquid pearls, whose gentle liquor bathed the plants that seemed, in turn, to send forth buds and rain down tiny white seed pearls, and willows dripped their sweet-tasting manna, the fountains laughed, the streams murmured, the, and the the woods rejoiced and the meadows flourished with her arrival. But as soon as the light of day made it possible to see and distinguish one thing from the from another, the first thing that appeared before Sancho Panza's eyes was the nose of the squire of the wood, which was so big it almost cast a shadow over the rest of his body. In fact, it is recounted that his nose was outlandishly large, hooked in the middle, uh, covered with warts, and of a purplish colour, like an eggplant. It came down the width of two fingers past his mouth, and its size, colour, warts, and curvature made his face so hideous that when Sancho saw him, his feet and hands began to tremble, like a child having seizures, and, and he decided in his heart to let himself be slapped 200 times before he would allow his anger to awaken and then fight with that monster. And sorry, just a real quick correction. Uh, the Squire of the Wood, I believe, is not uh, uh, Sanson the Bachelor. It's um, uh, another person from the village who's working under and with Sanson the Bachelor. And uh, another thing that I like, I think that we have, especially if you read only the first part, you, you believe that Don Quixote has this really sh like strong um, uh, conviction and he just cannot be persuaded that he is not a knight errant. Um, but I just wanted to read this extract. This is when um, uh, uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza are, uh, come and are being welcomed in by the Duke and the Duchess. And they say... Uh, welcome to the flower of chivalry, the greatest of all knights errant. And uh, this is the, the narration. And all or most of them sprinkled flagons of perfumed water on Don Quixote and on the Duke and Duchess, all of which astounded Don Quixote. And this was the first day he really knew and believed he was a true knight errant and not a fantastic one. For he saw himself treated in the same manner in which he had read knights were treated in past ages. Another thing of kind of peeling back the curtain of uh, uh, revealing uh, uh, Don Quixote's awareness of himself as a kind of character. Um, 
on whether or not Dolcinea exists because everyone who's read part one has heard about her but she didn't make an appearance in part one so it's like is she real? There is much to say about that, responded Don Quixote. God knows if Dolcinea exists in the world or not, or if she is imaginary or not imaginary. These are not the kind of things whose verification can be carried through to the end. This is one of the probably cruelest pranks that the Duke and the Duchess play on uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. They get him to mount a wooden horse uh, to go off and fight this, uh, you know, this uh, character or off in a distance and while they're up while they're on the horse they light some fireworks underneath them and uh, they're both blindfolded but uh, Sancho Panza decides to take a peek and he writes uh, he's talking now Sancho Panza is talking to the Duchess Senora, I felt that we were flying, like my master said, through the region of fire, and I wanted to uncover my eyes a little, but my master, who I asked for permission to cover to uncover my eyes, did not agree. But since I have some dab of curiosity in me and want to know what people try to and want to know what people try to stop me and keep me from knowing, very carefully, without anybody seeing me, right at my nose, I pushed aside just a little bit of the handkerchief that was covering my eyes, and I looked down at the earth, and it seemed to me that it was no larger than a mustard seed. Uh, see Jesus Christ in the Bible for um, uh, like uh, the relevance of the mustard seed. And the men walking on it, not much bigger than hazelnuts, so you can see how high we must have been flying. And then the Duchess points out how trippy it is for him to have seen the world the size of a mustard seed, but people the size of uh, hazelnuts. Uh, but the key extract, just two days, le uh, two pages later, is another thing of uh, again once more a, a unraveling of the kind of enigma and the persona that um, uh, that Don Quixote made. Uh, Earlier on in the book, Don Quixote goes down into a cave, has essentially like a, a long lucid dream, and is trying to figure out if the dream is real. He visits this very magical, mystical place in the cave of uh, Montesinos, and after Sancho Panza talks to Don Quixote about this thing he saw on uh, the fireworks, you know, the mustard seed world, uh, Don Quixote simply says, Sancho, just as you want people to believe what you have seen in the sky, I want you to believe what I saw in the cave of Montesinos. That is all I have to say. And the very last thing, this is when uh, Senor Don Antonio, uh, or Don Antonio, finds out that uh, uh, Senson has uh, kind of bested Don Quixote and has forced him to go back and uh, stay at his village for a year without uh, pursuing knight errantry. Uh, he says... Oh, Senor, may God forgive you for the harm you have done to the entire world in wishing to restore the sanity of the most amusing madman in it. Don't you see, Senor, that the benefit caused by the sanity of Don Quixote cannot be as great as the pleasure produced by his madness? And so, yeah, I haven't say I didn't, even though I did say spoilers, I didn't say exactly what happens at the end of Don Quixote, but uh, I wanted to save that just for anyone uh, who wanted to go through and read it. Um, this was a really, just a truly beautiful experience. I loved reading Don Quixote so much. I know it's going to be easily uh, one of my, um, a book that I want to kind of reread within within a decade hopefully but uh thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this quite long video uh this is the last book review of the year but um i uh, like i said i am gonna have another video or two uh coming out um mostly just a book awards video uh um so yep stay tuned for that thank you for watching and i'll see you all in the next video